write to it and it doesn't so let's try SDC1 that works so indeed we may need to reboot the system in order to be able to write to SDB1 or to perhaps redefine the partition and then create it so now we've created it let's part it L to see what's on SDC and there is the first partition and that's the wrong space let's go up and where's SDC here's SDC there's the first partition ext4 so it's available now we can actually make use of it by mounting it somewhere else so let's make directory temp 10g2 and then mount type ext4 dev which is optional it'll mount will automatically determine the, the type for us let's mount this into temp 10g2 echo the exit status and then execute mount to ensure that it has been mounted read write and then confirm that it contains a lost and found item and it is ready for usage and so far as making these partitions available across subsequent reboots you'll simply have to update FS tab. So four, make partitions available across reboots. And that simply entails, of course, modifying ETC FS tab to include entries that mount these two file systems, including the order in which they're to be scanned upon system initialization. Let's modify ETC FS tab. And you can take existing settings and just retrofit them. So for example, here we see an entry for root. We'll cut it with control K and then perhaps right after the swap file system will paste two entries and include a comment with a hash mark. And we'll just note temp FS's ext4. And this will be retrofitted to match the location in the dev tree of the object. So the first one is dev sdb1. The second is dev sdc1. In fact, we can just retrofit this and then copy and paste. So it's type ext4 defaults. If we'd like to use quotas, for example, user quota, group quota, we can specify them here as we've done on the other system. But of course, it entails turning on quotas. So user quota, group quota, in the event that we'd like to use it. The order in which it's to be checked, let's make it in line with boot, one, two, and then let's control K, control U twice, and then change this to SDC one. And we should update the mount points. So we should have done this first. So temp 10 G one, and this will be temp 10 G two. Now to ensure that these FS tab entries will succeed when the system reinitializes, we should unmount the recently mounted items in temp 10G1 and temp 10G2 and use the mount command to auto mount those items. We'll remove ourselves from the directory because it won't unmount if we're in the directory because it's assumed that we're using the directory. So create entries here then five, unmount both partitions and remount via ETC FS tab, which means we'll U mount. So U mount temp 10 G1 and U mount temp 10 G2 followed by, of course, a mount to be sure that they have been both mounted, unmounted successfully, or an echo of the exit status, either or. So let's try this out. And now both temp 10G1 10 and 10G2 have been unmounted. And to remount, we'll use the following. Let's update our notes. That's going to be B, mount A. Mount A simply instructs the mount command to read the contents of FS tab. So reads the contents of ETC FS tab and processes everything in it. 
as a consequence. Let's try this out and then echo the exit status to be sure that it's run successfully and then mount. So now we see dev sdb1 on temp 10g1, dev, SD, dev sdc1 on temp 10g2. Both are available for usage with user and group quotas, although we've yet to enable quotas using quota check, for example, on both. Let's just rpm query all grep quota to see if it's installed. It is by default, so it's a candidate for quota management. And both items are now available. Let's take a look at temp 10g1 or temp g star. And we see the original data created. Let's just populate temp 10g2 by copying some data from temp 10g1 over to temp 10g2. And a re-LSL will show that the content exists across both file systems. And again, they're across physical disks, so that means we should benefit from improved I.O. going across from physical disk dev sdb to physical disk dev sdc. Now, as mentioned, you can perform these options using fdisk, the allocation of partitions, and so on, but Parted tends to do a better job of committing the changes directly to the disk without requiring that the system be rebooted. In our case, it's given us a couple of complaints, so we're not able to write to DevSDB or DevSDB2, that is. Let's Parted list to take a look at that partition again. Scroll up and look for DevSDB. And indeed, two appears to exist, but the Make2FS program was unable to write to it. Let's just try that again. Make2FS type ext4 journaling dev sdb2 still doesn't exist. Let's use fdisk to try to manipulate dev sdb and let's print the table. It shows the partition but it doesn't allow us to write to it. With fdisk we can delete the partition by using the d option followed by the partition number and there it's deleted but then with fdisk you need to use w to write to the partition table and notice that the kernel returns the same error returned by parted so this tells us that neither tool will allow us to make changes to the partition without rebooting the system let's see what parted Parted's view is currently of it. It should show that the partition has been removed from dev sdb, and indeed it's been removed. Now let's just try to create it once more. Parted dev sdb, make part primary 10 GB to 20 GB, and the same error. So it doesn't allow us to, so we'll simply quit. So at some point we'll be able to access that partition, but partitioning is something you typically perform in single user mode or when the system is booting up. Let's just note partitioning is typically handled during installation and or within run level one or single user mode to facilitate exclusive access to the various disks that are of interest. So as a recap, to provision additional non-LVM storage, use parted or fdisk to allocate partitions on the disk. Once you've allocated those partitions, sans any complaints from the kernel, you then use make2fs or if you intend to use ext4, the make ext4 command, makefs.ext4 command, to overlay a file system of type ext4 on the dev tree device. Once the file system has been overlaid, you then create a directory within your hierarchy, somewhere off of root or perhaps deeper in the tree, to mount the newly allocated space. You mount the allocated space and ensure that it's available and attempt to create content in it. Look for the loss and found to indicate that it's a new partition and look for traces of any other data in the mount point. There should be none. Once that's all in place and it works, 
update etcfs tab to reflect the fact that there are new partitions available that are to be mounted whenever the system is initialized. To test that etcfs tab is properly configured, unmount the newly mounted partition or partitions, and then remount using mount-a. Mount-a forces mount to reread the contents of etcfs tab and any new items will be mounted as a consequence and should be made available to you. Now again, these are for partitions that are outside of the LVM scope. There are times that you just need some storage. It is suggested that when you install a system that you don't use or you never use all of the storage, leave a fraction, maybe 10, 20 or more percentage available in the event that you need it during an emergency, let's say due to disk failure, errors, or just the need for additional space. So with that additional space, you can create partitions and file systems, mount them, store data on them, remove them, so on and so forth. So that's a little bit about parted, fdisk, make2fs, makefs.ext4.